turn to Revelation chapter 3. <clears throat> so this morning I'll begin a new series called Context, Please, in which I will take 8 to 10 verses. I've got 8 picked out so far. far. There's a couple that I'm thinking about also doing. 8 to 10 verses that are most often taken out of context when you hear them used and help us to look at them in, <clears throat> in context. So hopefully this week when you get your midweek email uh, with some updates and some things like that, I'm actually going to try and list those verses. I'll, if I remember, I'll list those verses that, we're, that I know we're going to be preaching on uh, in that email so you'll know which ones <clears throat> we will be uh, looking at. I want to begin this series by, by telling a story that many of you may have heard me tell already, uh, but they're kind of like everybody loves Raymond reruns. They never get old. So <clears throat> here we go. Uh, when I was in Kentucky, uh, our state has a state mission offering. Most Baptist state conventions have state mission offerings. And so we collect that through our other, if you see where we're dividing numbers in our, uh, in our missions giving, it says state convention, that's what we use to give to our state state mission offer. So when I was in Kentucky, they're doing their state mission offer, and they always send out publicity materials. So they send out envelopes and posters and bulleted inserts and <clears throat> things to get people's attention on, on the offering and, and to get people to give to the offering. And they always have a theme. And the theme for this year in the Kentucky state mission offer would be utterly amazed. You know, and the whole idea would be utterly amazed at what God can do through missions offering when we're faithful through giving. I thought, well, that's a a good theme. And then I saw the verse they used, which was Habakkuk 1.5. And I said, that's not so good. <clears throat> because I knew the context of Habakkuk 1.5. What I want to do is I want to read Habakkuk 1, 1 through 11 to give you the context of what God was saying when he told Habakkuk, be utterly amazed. Habakkuk says, the prophecy that Habakkuk the prophet received, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. The wicked him in the righteous so that justice is perverted. So Habakkuk begins by praying to God, God, why are you letting all this evil and wickedness go on amongst your people? Why aren't you doing something about this? That's the context. And then God says... <clears throat> to Habakkuk, verse 5, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe if you were told. So God does answer back. He says, Habakkuk, I see the sin. I see the deceit. I see the wickedness. I am going to do something. You are going to be amazed. You're not going to believe what I'm about to do. And I don't know what Habakkuk was thinking at that point, but maybe when he heard this, he's thinking, this is great. God's going to do something. I can't, he's going to probably finally fix this problem. Here's what God says he's going to do. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swooping to devour. They all come with intent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They mock kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all the fortified cities. By building earthen ramps, they capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on, guilty people whose own strength is their God. So God did tell Habakkuk, be utterly amazed. He said, be utterly amazed at the judgment that I'm about to send to Israel at the hands of of the Babylonians. That's why God said be utterly amazed in this context. Habakkuk, I'm going to do something, and you're not going to believe what I'm going to do. I'm going to use a pagan, wicked culture to actually judge my own people. And certainly that would have made Habakkuk amazed. But it was a, it was a declaration of judgment. So I sent an, an email to the head of this organization because I'm just and one of those people who feels obligated to right wrongs. Okay? <laughs> and I sent an email to this organization. I said, listen, you yanked this verse out of context. To use it for your purposes. I said, this is a verse of, of judgment. I said, what you've done is you've pronounced judgment on the mission offering, which I'm sure was not your intention. And I got a nice email back. You know, I don't think they really were enthusiastic about what I sent. But I got a nice email back saying, thank you, but we've already got the promotional materials out. And we'll keep that in mind. 
But in my original email, I said, look, you're a Christian organization. You should be setting the example of putting verses and keeping verses in context. There were numerous other verses they could have used for probably even that very theme. But this was not the appropriate verse. They took it out of context. And context always matters. You can't just take a statement from an article or take a statement from, you know, something that you hear somebody say in a news uh, anchor say on the television, or even a co personal conversation you have somebody, you can't just take that statement and then tell somebody else what it is and actually give to them the true meaning of the statement unless you build the context. Here's what was going on at the time. Here's what was going on historically. Here's that person's background. Here's kind of the emotions in the moment. You're building the context so when the, when the, the statement, when you, when you hear the statement, you understand exactly what the statement uh, was, was meant to be. And context is especially significant with Scripture because we can't apply the Bible to our lives unless we understand what it means. Well, you don't truly understand what it means unless you put it in context. You have to know the historical context and the cultural context. And people say, well, Jamie, how am I supposed to know all that when I study the Bible on my, on my own? There are numerous resources out there to help you with that. Any good study Bible, if you buy it, is going to tell you, here's when it was written, here's what it was going on, Here's who wrote it. Here's kind of the culture in the time. So as you read that book of the Bible, you'll know exactly what was going on. Paul told Timothy in his instructions to Timothy as a pastor in 2 Timothy chapter 2 to rightly handle the word of truth so that Timothy would not be ashamed in his teaching. He told Timothy, he said, you can't just teach the Bible in the way you want. You have to make sure you handle it appropriately. The, the, the Bible, God's word, is called in God's word the sword of the spirit. There's a right way to handle a sword. If you don't handle a sword the right way, you're going to end up hurting somebody else or yourself or both. And that's why it's important to handle the sword of the spirit uh, correctly. Because if you don't, in your good intentions, you may hurt somebody else or hurt yourself. So I thought it would be fun and educational and actually important to just take some of the most commonly used out of context verses, out of context verses, and preach on them. This really began as a conversation I told you among my family. We just, I don't know what we were talking about specifically, but it came up the idea of verses taken out of context. You know, and so we just listed four or five right off the top of our head. And once we got, hey, once a pastor hears like four, that's a series. You know, he's taking notes. That's a series. So I said this might be a good series. So we listed as many. I had somebody else. Uh, my sister-in-law gave me one I decided to preach, and other people have made recommendations. I'm looking at them. We can't keep going on and on. But I did want to just take the commonly used ones so that next time you hear them, you know that they were in context. And I also want to sort of train us to always think context. Okay? When you hear somebody quote scripture to you, you need to be thinking context. What's going on in context there? Especially if somebody's using scripture against you or for their Purposes. What is that in context? If you're going to encourage someone with Scripture, you know, if you're going to make a point with Scripture, which I would highly recommend, that's the authority, but you have to make sure you do it in context. And as I was thinking about starting this, I also realized it's a pretty appropriate series to start after the finishing of our last series, which focused on the authority of God's Word. So we focused on the authority and the blessings of God's Word in Psalm 119, and now we're going to talk about rightly handling God's Word using these <clears throat> examples. So this morning we'll begin with a very common verse that you've probably heard if you've been around church any amount of time, numerous times over and over, and that is Revelation 3.20. Here's what Jesus said in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. All right, so that's the verse we're going to look at this morning. Now, what I'm going to do with this verse is what I'll probably do with the rest of them. That is, we'll look at the verse, then we'll look at how it's commonly used and usually inappropriately used. Then we'll look at what it really means in context, and then I'll talk to you, talk to you about the significant ways that we should be using the verse. Because my, my goal here is not to discourage you, of course, to use Scripture or any of these Scriptures I'm going to talk about. My goal is, if you're going to use any Scripture or any of these Scriptures, to make sure that we use them as they were meant to be used in Context. So how is, what is the context of Revelation 3.20, or how is it often used? Well, if you've been around church any amount of time, this is often used in evangelistic invitations. Okay, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's what somebody will say. Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart, and you have to let Jesus into your heart. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if this is where we got the phrase, ask Jesus into your heart. 
you probably heard people say that. You need to ask Jesus in your heart. Where did they get that? They might have gotten that from Revelation 3.20, where Jesus said, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. So they use that <clears throat> verse to, to say, look, if you need to come to faith in Christ, you need to open the door of your heart and let Jesus in. But is this the proper context of this verse? Well, let's look at the proper context. So let me read the whole passage that relates to this verse. So I'm going to read Revelation chapter 3. I'll start at verse 14. I'll read through verse 22. This is the final of seven churches that are addressed by Jesus uh, in the first three chapters of Revelation. So if you please stand, I'll read verses 14 to 22, Revelation 3. <clears throat> And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you would be either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich in white garments, so that you may clothe yourself, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen, and a Sabbath to anoint your eyes, so that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant to him to sit with me on my throne. As I have also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You can be seated. So you may actually remember this scripture from last summer because I actually preached on these seven uh, churches through Revelation over a seven-week series in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation. And each of these churches were rebuked for, for sins. Now, most of them were also complimented for things that were going on in the church. But the church of Laodicea, the last one, Jesus complimented them on nothing. He only rebuked them. And he actually preached this text when we went through that series. And what he told you was that the church was a lukewarm church. In other words, it was useless to God. Okay, Anything that is hot, hot, something hot water, hot liquid is useful, and cool uh, liquid is useful. But <clears throat> lukewarm liquid is not useful for anything. Nobody wants to drink that. I drank hot coffee this morning. I enjoyed it. I've even got to where if you take me to Starbucks to get me something cold, like a cold coffee. I can enjoy that. But if the hot coffee cools down and gets lukewarm, if the cold coffee heats up and gets lukewarm, I want no parts of it. It doesn't taste as good anymore. To me, it's useless. And Jesus says that this lukewarm church is useless because they are spiritually blind. They could not see their desperate situation. It doesn't look like Jesus is even present among them because the idea that he's giving is he's on the outside while they're on the inside. Okay, so he's basically saying this church might be an apostate church. It's full of people who think they are Christians, but actually they're not Christians. And we'll talk about why they might have known better here in just a moment. So his calling out or his, his knocking on the door is Jesus calling them, as he says, to repent. So it's possible that they were just, that there were some genuine believers and they didn't realize the situation they were in. He just calls them to repent. But the call is to them as a church and basically telling them that he had what they needed. So he was calling them to recognize that what they thought they had, they didn't have, and they needed to repent. Now, Andy made this point when he preached last summer. He said, back then, if a Roman soldier knocked on your door and you were supposed to answer the door, the Roman soldier was coming in. They were going to come in and say, look, we're Roman soldiers. We're here. Your job is to feed us and house us and make sure we have everything we need. Jesus paints a very different picture here in Revelation 3. He says, I'm knocking at the door. I have everything you need. You have nothing. You're desperate and needy. I have the clothes you need. I have the medicine you need for your eyes. I have the food you need. I have everything that you need. But the first and the most, I think the most important part of the context here is that this is addressed to a church. This is addressed to a corporate body of people who claim to be professing Christians, even though it looks like they perhaps, at least the majority of them, may not be professing Christians. Christians. So we already know right there it's to, to use Revelation 3.20 to talk to a person who's never professed in Christ and would never claim they professed in Christ is really taking it out of context. This wasn't a warning to just anybody. This was specifically a warning to people who thought they were Christians but perhaps were not. More on that in just a moment. 
So here's what I want to do. I want to give you four ways that I think this church, or, or this, this scripture, I'm sorry, talking about this church should be used. And the first one is the one that, that really hits me sideways when it comes to this scripture. <clears throat> okay? And that's this. I think when we look at this verse, we need to avoid the image of a weak, needy Jesus who's begging to come in to a person's heart or into a church as if he needs us. And this is the problem with how Jesus is often portrayed in evangelistic invitations and even as we share the gospel. And it's one of the primary issues I have with how this text is often used in any evangelistic setting is because it seems to me that it can be used to present Jesus as sort of this weak, puny beggar. Oh, will you please let me in? I'm trying so hard and I, I can't get in, which is not how this text presents Jesus and it's not how the rest of the Bible presents Jesus. Now. I'm about to pick on a hymn. Okay? It is not because it's a hymn. There's a lot of great hymns I love dearly. And anybody who knows me knows I'm an equal opportunity offender. I will pick on contemporary Christian music too. Okay? So this has nothing, has to do with the content and even how we sing certain things. So there's a hymn, many of you may be familiar with, The Savior is Waiting. Now think about how we sing this. Time after time, he has waited before. And now, he is waiting again to see if you're willing to open the door. Oh, how he wants to come in. We just kind of sing that as a kind of this puny Jesus knocking on the door of our hearts. Hey, I'm lonely out here. I'm lonely. It's starting to rain. It's getting cold. I need to come in. That's kind of how we sing that song. That's kind of how we look at this text a lot of times. Instead of how the New Testament, how does the New Testament portray the resurrected Christ. Well, let's see. When he appeared to Saul, who would later become the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 9, he appeared in such glory that Paul, that Saul, who became Paul, was temporarily blinded. Temporarily blinded. Then in Ephesians 1, Paul says that Christ was raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of his father. He said, far above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age to come. And that God put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul told Timothy that Jesus is the blessed and only sovereign, King of kings and Lord of lords. Some of the most powerful imagery of Christ comes from the book of Revelation. For example, Revelation chapter 5, verse 5 says he is the Lion of Judah, the Root of David, who has conquered and is the only one worthy to open the scroll and the seven seals. And then in chapter 19 of Revelation, Jesus is seen as the rider on a white horse, He's called faithful and true. He judges and makes war in righteousness. He has eyes of fire. His robe is dipped in blood. A sword is coming out of his mouth. And written on his robe and his thigh is the King of kings and Lord of lords. That is not a weak, puny Jesus who's knocking on the door of people's hearts, hoping they might let him come in. If Jesus is knocking on the door of the church, he is doing it with power, authority, and clarity. He's saying, hey, I'm here. You need me. I don't need you. You need me. You need to recognize who I am, what I have, your needs, and I'm the only one that can provide those needs. And I am, am not the same. But I am I'm here. But he's not presented as weak. Now, I just ruined your favorite hymn. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay? And if you hold a different view of that hymn and think, well, I never looked at it like that, that's fine. I'm just saying we have to be careful how we view Jesus. Even the way we view him sometimes in culture, it's Jesus carrying the lamb. You know, and there's no doubt Jesus carries us where his lamb. But he also is willing to beat a bear to death with a stick if he comes after us. Okay? So just keep balanced, you know, in your mind who Jesus is. And certainly the idea of Jesus sort of just knocking in the heart of Revelation 20 of a person hoping maybe the person will answer is not the vision that we have of Revelation 3.20 that we should have in our mind. So let's avoid that image of a weak, needy Jesus when we think about Revelation 20. Secondly, this is a warning to the church, so it's most appropriately used, not with those who know they're not Christians and don't claim to be. It's most appropriately used with people who claim to be Christians, but then their actions and they and demonstrate their actions demonstrate they may not be. It's a, it's a warning to churches. Okay, by I guess. Uh, by relation of warning even to Christians who think they are they are true believers in Christ, but who actually are not true believers 
in Christ. So Jesus said these words to a church. By church, we mean people who were, in that moment, professing to be followers of Jesus. And his warning was this. He said, you claim to be mine, but I think you're useless. And here's the evidence. Based on your own actions, I, I don't believe you are mine. Okay, he, wasn't, he wasn't addressing those who thought they, they, who knew they weren't his. He was addressing those who thought they were his, but in fact probably were not. So it's this warning to the church, and that's really who this text is for. It's very similar to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, which is, Matthew 7 is a, is a scary text. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, speaking of the day of judgment, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then Jesus said, I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. So here we have people who believe they are in Christ, but in fact, they find out they are not, and it's too late. And this is what Jesus is saying in Revelation 3. He said he knew the church's works, so this was not an idle church. Okay, This wasn't a church who was lazy or not doing anything. They were doing some things and may have even been doing some things that looked good from the outside. But what made them lukewarm to the point that they want, that Jesus literally says want, Jesus wanted to vomit, okay, is because they were unaware of their own sin and need, and they had not themselves actually come to Jesus for healing and forgiveness. In verse 17, Jesus said that they don't realize they're wretched and poor and without clothes and blind. They've been doing many good things, okay, but, or many things, but at the end, their good works, as Isaiah 64 says, were like filthy rags. They didn't count. Now, why didn't their good works count? Because nothing is more nauseating to Jesus than a person who claims to be his follower, but who is unwilling and unable to see their own sin and need for forgiveness, and then assume somehow that their works are going to make them righteous. This was the fallacy of the Pharisees. This is why Jesus was so hard on the Pharisees. What was the Pharisees' problem? The Pharisees basically were willing to point out everybody else's sin, okay? And at the same time were not willing to confront their own sin. And then they thought that in their righteous deed and works, that will get them to God. That's exactly what Jesus is speaking about here. That's why the, 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 the church in Revelation was... was uh, was, was maybe an apostate church here because they, they had done all these great things, but, but they really didn't know Jesus. And they were depending on their good works. And we know that because if you look at Matthew chapter 7, listen to what they say. He said, Lord, Jesus said, many are going to say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons and perform many miracles? What are they doing there? They're saying, God, didn't we do enough? I mean, did you not see all the good we did? Anybody who thinks they're going to stand before God and say, don't you see all the good I did as a rationale to, to, to be accepted by God doesn't understand the grace they need. And that's what was happening in Revelation chapter 3. So Jesus is not calling out to those in these verses who know they're not his. Not that he doesn't call out to them. That is true. This is just not the context of this verse. He's calling out to those who have heard of him, who think they've accepted him, and they think they are his, but they've never come Truly to faith in Christ, and we know that because they're still trying to earn God's favor, and they have, and this is the key, they have they, have, they cannot see their sinfulness. And one of the clear signs of salvation is you're keenly aware of your sin. Alright? When you're thinking about an evidence of salvation, you know, one of the things, I mean, even first John talks about that. He who says he's without sin is is a liar, and that they're not one of us, essentially. So anybody that doesn't see the depths of their sin isn't really a Christian. Christians understand the depths of their sin. Okay, Christians know this. As bad as you think I am, I'm a whole lot worse. They get it. But the people in Revelation here, the church of Laodicea didn't see that. They thought they were fine. They were doing good things. They didn't recognize that Jesus wasn't even among them. He wasn't even there. <clears throat> so Jesus is not calling out to those here who have never heard of him or who have never accepted him. He's calling out to those who think that they have come to faith in Christ, but really haven't. And he, he indicts them on the fact that they've never really dealt with the depth of their own sin. They still think they're better than everybody else, and they still think that that better than everybody else is what's going to get them to heaven when it's not. Third, here we're reminded of the need for Christ to be among us in the center of all we do. So Jesus knocks and he calls out for them to answer. 
He says, if you will, I will come in and eat with whoever answers. So this call to salvation is also a call to fellowship with Christ and to call us to continue to be with Christ. And if we are to eat with him, it is to eat the bread of life that he has provided in himself. And Jesus, when he, not, he doesn't just say, I have what you need. Jesus says, I am what you need. Okay, it's part of who, who I am. And he doesn't come in as a guest. He comes in as a savior. And he comes in and he doesn't sit as a counselor among many in our lives. He comes in and he puts himself in the center of our lives. And yes, he will fellowship with us. But as I <clears throat> want you to understand, Jesus doesn't come in to take part in what we're doing. He comes in to take over. That's what he, when he says, you answer the door, this is what you need to expect. He does not desire to be a guest of the church who comes in and out occasionally. But the one, when he calls, when a church says, we want Jesus in the middle, we always want Jesus in the middle. We can't have Jesus, follow Jesus when it's good for this circumstance, but when this circumstance comes along, uh, we're going to do our own thing. Okay? A lot of churches do that. Well, when it comes to this, we're going to do what Jesus calls us to do. When it comes to this, we're going to go our own way. I never forget in seminary. Uh, where there was a guy, I, remember, I don't remember what class, but I remember very distinctly prayer request time, and he said, pray for my church, because they were starting VBS, and it was a, a, a majority white church, and they had black children showing up for VBS, and one of his deacons pulled him aside and said, this can't happen. We can't, and, and the pastor was just shocked. He had never been given, like, any inclination this was going to be an issue. And the pastor said, but you know, the Bible says, and the deacon stopped him right there and says, you got to understand something. I don't care what the Bible says on this. They're not coming. And, of course, he was at that point essentially going to resign. He wasn't going to pastor a church that was going to have that kind of, of attitude. And I suppose he could have stayed and fought, but get fired, resign, whatever. You know, I probably would have stayed and got fired just as a badge of honor. You know, but <clears throat> that's not, I don't think, what he chose to do. But there's a church that says, hey, Jesus... We'll welcome you on this topic, but on this one, we won't. And we have all kinds of ways of communicating to Jesus sometimes that you're a guest. You know, we don't want you to stay. Just like you communicate and, and when people come over to your house and they're guests, if they're staying too long and it's becoming inconvenient, you communicate with them too. You don't look at them and go, look, you've been over here too long and you need to leave. You know what you do? You look at the clock and go, oh, it's already 9.30? Oh, man. I didn't realize it was that late, especially since i got to get up early in the morning. The person keeps talking. And you may be thinking, Jamie, you're that person when you're over our house. You just keep talking. <laughs> can I just tell you, if I'm ever over your house, and I, you can look at me and say, hey, you got to go. I got I to get some sleep. Okay? I will not be offended. So then they don't leave. So then, it, you're, you know, you're getting up. Then you start yawning. Oh, boy. It's it's really, you know, tiring. I'm, you know, it's, I'm really tired. Boy, I had a, had a long day. They still don't get So you keep dropping hints. Nowadays, I tell them, just start coughing. They'll leave. They start coughing. They'll leave. They're, you know, I can't. I've been having this cough for two days, and I think I've got a fever. They're out of there. You know what I mean? Worries about them staying in your house at that point. When we drop these subtle hints. We don't come right out and say we don't want them there, but we say we, they're temporary. I mean, a guest is temporary. You know, they come in, they leave. They may come in at least several times. You have family that visits. They're guests. They're guests on a regular basis. That's how churches treat Jesus sometimes. You're a guest. We want you sometimes. We don't want you. Other times, but Jesus is not interested in being a guest. And abiding in and with Christ is essential for the church. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 9 through 10, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. So we're united with Christ so that whether we're alive or we're dead, we are with him. Our, our lives are tethered and connected to him. Now, in heaven, Jesus is the focal point. And I think most of us are at the point we would admit that. Now, we other people like to make themselves the focal point of heaven. That's why they want to play golf in heaven and go fishing in heaven and do all kinds of things. Because heaven is about them. But once you begin to understand heaven is about Christ, you, get, you, you begin to transform your view of heaven. And that everything is heaven is, is centered around Christ. And we're okay with that. But we don't want to do that here. Jesus, you can be the focus of eternity, but in my life right now, I've got me as the focus or something else, which usually just gets traced back to you. All right? So if we expect Jesus to be the center of eternity, which he is, why would we not do everything possible to make him the center of who we are and what we do today? Knowing that even Jesus said in 
John 15, 5, that apart from him, we can do nothing. We accomplish nothing as a church, corporately, or as individual Christians apart from abiding in uh, and walking with Christ. So it means nothing that we say or do can be separated from Jesus and his gospel. 1 John 2, 6 says, whoever says he abides in me or in Christ ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Well, that's true for the church. It's true for us as individuals uh, as well. So we're reminded of the need for Christ to always be among us. Him and his gospel and his mission is at the center of everything that we do. He's, we don't consult him. Okay, He's not a consultant. We don't have him on retainer where we just call him when we'd like to get some advice on something and then decide whether or not we take or leave what he what he says. So Jesus says, if you knock and, and, and if I knock and you answer, I'm coming in. I'm coming in to take part of what you're doing. Take part in what you're doing. I'm coming in to take over. It's my church. Remember, we were bought with a price. The church is Christ's. Okay? He purchased us. We are not ourselves. No Christian ever has the right to say, I have the right to my own life. Jesus bought you with his blood. You're his. All right? And then fourth, and this is closely related to the third point, because it talks about the fellowship and abiding in Christ aspect, but it adds a little bit of a different <clears throat> nuance to it. Don't miss the fellowship aspect of salvation and being united with Christ. And I would even add to this, as a church, there's a fellowship aspect of salvation and being united with Christ that we experience when we're together as a church. So we work as a church for Christ, but we also work, as we have seen, with Christ and fellowship with him through his spirit. So he is bodily today at the right hand of God. Uh, interceding on behalf of those who have come to faith in him. But we are also deeply connected with him and united with him through his spirit, the Holy Spirit, especially as we relate to each other, his church. Now, why is the picture of a dinner, when, when, when talking about the church here, the church welcoming Jesus, why is there this picture of this dinner and coming in and eating? And it's because there's no more intimate setting for people, and nothing brings out and fosters relationship with people and connection more than a good meal. I don't know about you, but when I call somebody and say, hey, you want to get together for something? There's, the next question is what? Where are we going to eat? Where are we going to eat? All right, I don't ever call people and say, hey, you want to get together and just talk? Now, you might. Guys just don't do that kind of thing. All right? You know, no, there's going to be food involved. Okay? You have people over your house. You don't ever have people over your house just to say, hey, you want to get together and talk? No. You may say play games, but guess what's going to be there? Food. You're going to have food. Now, why is that? Because I think there's a connectivity that happens when you're sharing a meal together. I mean, this is seen throughout uh, Scripture. For example, even when God is talking about grace in the Old Testament, here's what he says in Isaiah 55. Come all you who are thirsty, come to waters, and you, will have no, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Now, how can you have no money and buy and eat? He says, come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend on what is not bread and your labor on that does not, what, what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. God says, the buffet has been put out of grace, has been put out. And you say, well, I don't have, any, I don't have nothing, anything to bring. And God says, come anyway. Take as much of my grace as you want. It's yours. It's free. I bought everything. You didn't have to buy Anything. We even know when we're going over to people's house and we're like, hey, just come over for meals, for a meal. What do you want us to bring? But we don't want you to bring anything. I'm telling you, you're going to bring something. You just feel weird. You know, they may provide the bulk of it. I've got to at least bring a dessert or some drink or something, a bag of ice cups. Can I bring something to this? Because that's, like, that's us wanting to feel like we added something to the experience. Jesus says, you want to come to me and you want to feast. You got to admit you can't bring anything. You got nothing to bring me. You got nothing that's good. Everything you have is tainted. All I'm asking is for you to show up, admit you're hungry, and then eat as much as you want. Why do we as a church like to get together to eat? Is it because the food is fantastic? That's part of it. All right. But primarily, I'm going to argue it's the fellowship aspect of it. That's why we get together to eat. Okay. Because there's a connection that takes place. And even if I told you, hey, we're going to have this meal, and I'm just going to tell you, the food is not going to be that great. All right? Everybody who wants to show up, they'd still show up. Most people would still show up. Why? Because it's not the food, the reason they're being here. Now, I've never had a bad meal here. I don't know. I've, I've never had one.
But you show up because you know the fellowship that's going to take place. You like being together. Well, that experience is what happens in the church, this togetherness. You have experiences with a church and within the church that you cannot have as an individual Christian. Okay, you have to be connected to a local church and be active and committed to a local church and prioritize a local church to even experience the fellowship that Jesus is talking about here because this is being preached to a church. Okay, he calls them to this relationship. And while we do have a personal relationship with Christ in the sense that you do come to Christ individually by faith, your whole family, your whole family may come to faith in Christ at the same moment. But that means each person in that family made a personal decision to follow Christ. So in that aspect, we have a personal relationship with Christ. But then you have a corporate relationship from there. And you're supposed to have a relationship with the church. You don't find Christians in the Bible that, did, that weren't active in churches or didn't participate in churches. It was just non-existent. There's no way a person can look at somebody and say, well, I'm a Christian, but church really isn't that important. It, it's, it's, they're inconsistent. You can't do that. You can't be by yourself. You're not the body of Christ. You can only be the body of Christ with other people. You can't be the body of Christ by yourself. So there's this, these experiences and, and this fellowship. If you desire to have fellowship with Jesus, you can't do that apart from a local church. You can't have that being uncommitted. You can't say, well, I prioritize my personal relationship with Christ, but my corporate relationship with this church, that's not as important. They're equally important. Your personal relationship is going to affect your relationship with other believers. And your relationship with other believers as a whole is going to impact your personal relationship. That's just the way God designed it. That's just the way that God designed it. And so when Jesus comes in, he says, I'm going to fellowship with you. He's saying, well, I want to, I, we're all, I'm not going to say we're all in this together because I'm so tired of hearing that on the news. Uh, but I want to say we are, we are there's a togetherness that takes place that God meant when he saved us. He saved us and incorporates us into a family. One of, the, one of the key metaphors of salvation is adoption. The whole idea of adoption is being adopted into what? A family. Nobody says, well, I got adopted, but then I went out on my own. That doesn't even make sense. Well, it doesn't make sense in the New Testament either. So this is why you cannot have a close relationship with Christ, but forsake the church. And why your fellowship with Christ and your closeness and intimacy with Christ is always going to be in some way directly impacted by your closeness and relationship with his church. It's also why the idea of going into a church, well, I'm a member of a church, but I, I haven't really got connected, haven't really got plugged in. I've been going, you know, to this church for five years, but I like to go in and I just like to leave. You're not experiencing that fellowship. That's, that's actually a dangerous way to view church. One of the things I like about grace is if you're here, we're going to know you. You know, there's good and bad to that. Don't get me wrong, but we're going... We're going to know you because the fellowship aspect is so important to us. We want to know you. We, we, we're family. Family. There are things that I know that, that I know about my family. You're not going to know about because it's family. Well, there are things that's great. We're family. There are things we know about each other. We're, other people aren't going to know about. Why? Because we're family. But we're okay with that. So there's this togetherness that needs to take place. So if you want to have fellowship with Christ, you have to do it in the context. Of the church. So seeing Revelation 3.20 as a call to salvation is not really inaccurate. So long as you understand if it's a call to salvation, it's a warning to the church. You think you're Christians, you're not. You, you haven't even invited me in. I'm not anywhere to be seen when you come together. I'm not there at all. You're doing a lot of great things. Society thinks you do some good stuff, but there's no fellowship. There's no intimacy. I'm not considered. I'm not there at all. This is actually a warning to to the church. And in, in that warning to the church is also a warning to Christians to make sure that you understand if you're, if, how, how do I know I've come to faith in Christ? Well, the first thing is you better be aware of your sinfulness. You better understand you needed Jesus. The whole mind, any mindset that says, well, I came to faith in Christ, I accepted Jesus into my heart, but I was just told what I needed to do. I mean, there's a there's a, a weight and a depth of your sinfulness you really need to be aware of. You don't, you shouldn't wallow in it. You shouldn't you know, beat yourself up over it, but the recognition, it's there. You know, it, it is there. Just the recognition, like, if, if Jesus didn't do the work, I got no shot. If it's in any way, shape, or form up to me, I don't stand a chance. I mean, I, actually, if I thought it was any way up to Jamie, I'd, I'd quit trying. I'd live however I wanted. 
because it wouldn't even be worth the effort. Because there's no way I can measure up. And so Jesus had to measure up for me. And then recognize that, and yes, we need to be about good works or doing things, but it's out of gratitude for what Christ has done for us. It's not because we're trying to earn our way to him in any way, shape, or form. Okay, And certainly there's the call here to take care of our own sinfulness among us before we start pointing fingers at the culture. I don't point a lot of fingers at the culture. You'll probably recognize, and here's why. I got enough problems with you guys. I'm just <laughs> kidding, sort of. As a pastor, though, you're like, look, I, you just look around and you say, we got enough to keep us busy holding ourselves together, making sure we're living like we should, that the whole idea of pointing fingers at other people outside of the church, people who don't even claim to be Christians, why are we wasting our time doing that in a lot of ways? So what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5, he said, I didn't tell you to be separate from people who, you know, weren't Christians. I told you to separate yourself from people in the church who claim to be Christians, but they're not living like it. All right, Paul said the people on the outside, they're going to do what they do. We shouldn't expect them to act like Christians. Our responsibility toward them is to share the gospel. That's about where it begins and ends. Okay, our responsibility among ourselves is accountability, growth, sanctification, encouragement, praying for one another. You know, it's it's like if you if you go if you go if you've been to a crowded like Disney World or a theme park or somewhere like that, you know, there's kids running everywhere. All right, you're just trying to keep your two or three or four together. Okay. If another kid's run off or climb and doing something they, sh they shouldn't, well, why aren't you yelling at that kid? Because you're thinking, I got, enough, I got enough to worry about keeping my, with this craziness around, I got enough to worry about keeping my family in order and worry about everybody else's. Well, that's kind of the way we should think about ourselves. I got enough going on in here, all right? I, I ain't got time to start telling the world how bad they are, you know, before I, I, I got plenty to work on up here. We have got plenty to do amongst ourselves to spend a whole lot of time whining and complaining about what's going on out there. There's, there's plenty to do here. And the problem is we can fall into the trap of Laodicea where we start so focusing on the outside, we start to believe great things about ourselves. When Jesus says, no, you're poor and you're needy. You're needy and you're needy. If you bow your heads. <clears throat> I would ask you, first of all, about your view of who Christ is, the post-resurrected Christ. How have you seen him? Do you see him as the sovereign Lord of Lords and King of kings and all-powerful, God in the flesh, reigning king? Or have you kind of weakened your view of it? You know, that's why I tell you, when you share the gospels with somebody, sit up straight, talk with gratitude, you know, and confidence, because you're not telling the story of a weak, puny Jesus who had to go to the cross, and thank goodness he was raised from the dead. You're talking about the king of kings, God who put on flesh, chose to go to the cross, said, kill me, I'll raise myself from the dead, ascended into heaven, and reigns today. That's the Christ you communicate to other people. Has your focus been too much on the outside of people who claim they don't know Jesus, and you know they don't know Jesus without either taking care of the sin in your own life or even confronting each other about sin? And you start to get kind of that self-righteous mindset. Have you neglected the fellowship of the church? It's important. You, and I, I'm completely confident saying this on the authority of God's word. There's no way you're going to grow in fellowship with Christ apart from being active in a local church. Period. There's no evidence of it in scripture. It's not taught in scripture. There's no example of it in scripture. It is absolutely crucial. Father, we are thankful for your patience with us, and Lord, that you do knock, and you do say, I'm here, and I have what you need, and you better realize it. Father, you do that out of love and mercy. Nothing, nothing forced your hand to stop and consider us. Nothing forced your hand to save anybody. You do it out of grace and love and mercy, but we need to have a right view of who you are and a right view of who we are. Lord, as a church, as Grace Baptist Church, I pray that we would never find ourselves in the, in the days of this church of Laodicea, where we're going about doing our thing, and Christ has completely left the building. And we think we're Christians, and we think we're doing what we're supposed to. There's no
no talk of the gospel, no talk of Jesus, no talk of scripture. We've gotten too caught up in doing the way things, th things the way we would like them done. Lord, we do not want you to be a consultant. We want you to operate as who you are, which is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We desire for you to come in and not take part, but to come in and take over. And we pray these things in Jesus' name.